All right, guys. Um, we will go ahead and get started with our chapter two. So this is the chapter where we're getting into uh, basically functions. We'll be talking about uh, what the functions are, function notation, and then of course start working with those functions. Uh, of course, graphing will be part of that, doing different types of operations uh, with those functions. But obviously the first thing we want to do is define what a function is. So uh, just some uh, simple example to kind of show what a function can be and cannot be. So here we're talking about if you spend $10 on gasoline, then the price per gallon uh, will determine the number of gallons you get. So if you think about it, um, just with the grade 85, what's the price per gallon right now? About $250, $260. $250, $260. Ooh, it went up last, since I got my gas bill. I was at 240 when I had it filled, so it looks like it's gone up. And of course, um, if you know the price per gallon, let's say it's 250, right? And we know we're spending $10, then how many gallons did we end up getting at 250 a gallon? Four, Four gallons, right? Um, because 250 was kind of a nice number. Uh, <coughs> if it was 240, then you would get slightly more than four gallons, right? So you can see, if I know the price per gallon, I know I'm spending a total of $10, I was able to come up with how many gallons I'm going to get. Now here, for the second part, we're saying the number of hours that you sleep before a test might be related to your grade on the test, but does not determine your grade. So is that true? If the longer you sleep, will you get a better grade? The shorter amount of time you sleep, will you get a bad grade? I'm about to test the longer part yet. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the number of sleep is really not going to determine anything as far as your grade goes, right? You may feel more rested if you've slept more. Um, and maybe because you're rested, maybe you'll do a little bit better on the test. But then, of course, there are students who sleep two hours before an exam and still can end up doing really well on it. So the number of sleep would have nothing. So the first example we can define as a function, but the second one we cannot. So here they're saying, uh, if the value of a variable y is determined by the variable x, uh, then you can say that y is a function of x, or basically that y depends on the value of x here. So in that case, with our gallons and the number of gallons example, your y value would be the number of gallons, and the x value would be the price per gallon. So the, how many gallons you got depended on what you ended up paying for each gallon in your um, calculation here. So when we're saying y is a function of x, like I said, it's basically saying y is determined by x or y is depending on x. Now, they're also saying if there is more than one value for y corresponding to that same value for x, then we will say that y is not determined by x and y is not a function of x. So we're basically saying for the same value of x, we should not come up with two different y values. So think about it with the gas, uh, gasoline example. Uh, at $2.50 a gallon, I'm spending $10. I should only get one answer for how many gallons I'm getting in my car, right? We should not come up with two different values. But when you think about the sleep example, two people could have slept the same number of hours, right? Let's say both of them slept seven hours before the test, but one person ended up getting, um, I don't know, 60 on their exam, the other one got an 80. So you can see for the same number of hours of sleep, we got two different values for what their grade was on the exam. So that's when, again, it's not a function. For the same value of x, we should not have two different values for y. Um, so keeping that relationship in mind, what can you tell me about these two examples here? The first one says a, is the length of any rectangle that has a width of five inches and B is the perimeter of that rectangle. So can I say A depends on the value of B, B depends on the value of A, but there's no relationship between those two variables. Yes, Amy. Uh, B is depending on A. So you are saying the perimeter is dependent on the length of the rectangle when we know the width is five inches, okay? I can see that. 
Will the relationship work in the reverse order? So let's see. Yes. I think so. You think so? So if we knew the length of the rectangle, would we be able to calculate the perimeter? Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can get this guy. Let's open here. So for a rectangle, what is the perimeter? <coughs> Formula. I feel like I've, we've had this conversation before. So what is it? E. Just the letter B. No. No. No, I'm not asking specific to that example. I'm just asking in general what is the formula for the perimeter of a rectangle? It's two times the width plus two times the length. Yeah. Two times the width plus two times the length. So in our example, they're saying let B be the perimeter, right? They're telling us the width of the rectangle is five inches and the length is called A, right? So the idea is if I know the value of B, will I be able to work backwards and calculate A? Yes. If I know the value of A, can I work backwards or forwards to calculate the value of B? So in this example, you can actually say A is a function of B. And you can also say that B is a function of A. Because it actually works in both directions. Okay? If it only worked in one direction, then yes, we would have to pick one or the other, but in this case, it goes both ways. All right, so going to our second <coughs> example here. A is the final exam score for a student in your class, and B is his or her semester grade. So A is the final exam score, B is the semester grade. No? Why not? How heavily are they weighted? Or okay. <laughs> what else? There's no number value to work with. Right. Well, the final exam score would be a number value, wouldn't it? The semester grade would be your. But age. there's no like percentage, kind of like what she was saying. There's no starting point. Okay. Yes. Let's see. Based on it could be any score. A can be a function of B. However, B cannot be a function of A. Okay, so you're saying A can be a function of B. Okay, just to kind of clarify that, when you say A is a function of B, you are basically saying you can determine what the final exam score is by looking at their semester grade. So B would be a function of A, but not A. Like B. So B is a function of A is where you're saying if you knew A, which is their final exam score, you will be able to calculate their semester grade. Okay, so do we agree with Spencer? That if you knew their final exam grade, you would be able to calculate their semester grade. Okay, I'm seeing two of you shake your heads. Amy, why not? Um, because there's more factors that go into your grade than just the final exam. Okay, there can be more factors that go into your grade. If you just look at our class, we know we've got the homework and the chapter exams and the quizzes additional to the final exam. Okay, but what else? Were you kind of thinking the same thing? Yeah, because I mean, right now, if you were to put that as A is a function of B, if your final exam was 100 and your semester grade was 80, 100 doesn't equal 80, so there's no function there. There's no function there, okay? Now remember what I said about repetition. Now think in those terms. If two students had the same final exam score, does that mean they would have the same semester grade? No, because it comes back to your argument, which was what other factors are you know, going into that calculation of the grade, and you kind of said the same thing. Uh, and the same thing in the reverse relationship, right? If you knew their semester grade, would you be able to come up with their final exam grade? 
No, because again, we have no idea how these grades are working. So for number two, actually, we would say the relationship is neither. And there's always that possibility of repetition happening, right? Because two students, like I said, can have the same semester grade, but does not mean they'll have the same final exam grade. So that doesn't work. All right, so that's basically what we mean by functions. You should not have this repetition happening. And if you look at the definition, now your textbook actually has more definitions than this. I just picked one of the ones that seem more straightforward. So they're saying think of your function as a set of ordered pairs in which no two ordered pairs have the same first coordinate and different second coordinates. So if you think of x as being our first coordinate and y as being our second coordinate, we're saying you cannot have the same first coordinate with two different y coordinates. If that does not happen, it's a function. If it does happen, then it's not a function. So the different ways of how we can identify if we are in fact looking at a function or not. So we're gonna go through uh, quite a few different examples here. Just to kind of define, um, a function is basically, you can think of any relation because you know we're talking about relationships between variables, between x and y. However, not all relations can be functions. You have to have the special property of where for the same x I cannot have two different y values for them to be identified as functions. So everything that you will see will definitely be a relation, but if they satisfy this definition of ours, then they will be a function. So as you can see, not every relation is going to be a function. So we're starting out with our vertical line test. We're saying a graph is a graph of a function if and only if no vertical line crosses the graph more than once which means if you draw a vertical line through a graph and it crosses at only one point through the graph, it's a function. If it crosses at more than one point, it's not a function because that means for the same x value, I have two different y values or more. So let's take a look at these guys here. So if we try to draw vertical lines through them, I'm gonna find the one right here. Well, vertical issue. So the vertical line will cross our graph at just one point, right? You can see right over here, my vertical line is crossing the graph, which means it's only crossing at one point. This example in number three is a function. So what do you think happens with number four then? It's not going to be a function because when I draw a vertical line through that, it's going to cross at two different places, right? So you can see for this x value right here, I have a positive y value and for that same x value, I have a negative y value. So for the same x, two different y values, which is what makes this not function. Okay. So with that logic, what happens with number five? Not a function, and you can actually see that for the same x value, positive two, I have two different y values. I've got a positive three and a negative one. So obviously just using that line itself, it's failing and it's not going to be a function. Number six, it is a function and you can actually draw vertical lines wherever you like they're only going to cross the function at one point, right? The graph at one point. So definitely number six, we would say is a function. Obviously the vertical line test would be one of the easier tests to identify a function, but now what happens if we look at set of ordered pairs? So we've got these ordered pairs here. We've got one, two, and three in this one. You've got four here and three again here. So you're looking for the definition for the same x values, uh, do I have two different y values? So what can you say about number seven? It is a function, because there's no repetition happening in the x, right? right? Which means you don't have anything to worry about. And I'm using abbreviations because as you can see, the board's trying to act really funny with me 
writing on it. So functional number seven, <coughs> what about eight? It's not a function. Not a function? It is. It is? Okay, so I'm getting both answers. Which one is it? Why do you think it's not? Does it, so does it, are you looking for just one value is the same for a different value or are you looking for specifically for the same x i cannot have two different y values right so in this one you will see my x is not repeating i've got 0 0.5 0 1 and 9 so no x values are repeating the 7 which is the y value is repeating which is okay but for the same x i cannot have two different y so this guy will actually be a function Okay, nine, it's not. not a function because this one obviously is screaming I'm not a function. I have the same x value but two different y values. So this is where it fails and it's not a function. Okay. <coughs> All right, look through 10, 11, and 12 and tell me what you guys think. Trevor, what do you think for number 10? Is that a function or not a function? Not a function. Not a function. And where does it fail? At the 3 and 6 and 3 and 12. Yeah, again, for the same x value, you've got two different y values, which makes this, again, not a function. All righty. Very good. Uh, let me see. Jeremy, what do you think about number 11? Uh, actually, it wasn't a function. It wasn't a function? Okay, what's making you come to that conclusion? You take it back? Okay, yeah, it's, it is a function because we don't have any repeating x values. Again, this actually is very similar to your number 8. The y values are repeating, but we have no repetition happening on the x, which makes this guy into a function. All right, very good. Let's see, number 12. Valerie, what do you think? A number function? 12. Function? It is a function because again, there's no repetition happening on the x. All right, very good. So that's using a graph, looking at a set of ordered pairs, and looking at a table. Now, obviously, most of the time when we're working with functions, we're working with equations. So, looking at an equation, how do we determine if it's a function or not? Any ideas of how we can go about deciding if we are looking at a function or not? We just see if there's more than one x value that or more than one. Go ahead. I was going to say we just see if there's more than one variable that fits the equation. But I wasn't sure if there's. So the idea is for the same x, I should not get two different y values, right? So the first thing we would actually start with is get your y by itself. So start by rewriting your y. So here, let me get my hand out. Okay. You are given x equals dy. Minus 9, we're trying to get the y by itself plus u. So start by adding that 9. And then what do we do? Yeah, divide by 3 to get the y by itself. So we would end up with, I'm just going to write my y on the left. You've got x divided by 3. I'm actually going to write that as 1 third x. And then 9 divided by 3, which has become a 3. So it's actually looking pretty promising at this point, but just to check and make sure that for one single um, x value, I will get one single y value. Let's just put something in 
for x. Do I put zero? Okay, so if I put the zero in, what will I get? One equals three. One equals three because this guy becomes a zero, right? We put one x value in, we got one x value out, right? So that actually tells me that this guy is in fact a function. So we get the same answer. Sorry? So we get the same answer. Yeah. Because we put one x value in, we got one x value out, which is really, really good. That's exactly what we wanted. Now, let's see what's happening in number 14. You are given y squared minus x squared equals 9. We're trying to get the y by itself. What should we do first? Go ahead and move the x squared to the other side. So add x squared. Okay. And then what? Yeah, take the square root because we want to get rid of that square on the y term. So we'll take square roots on both sides. And what happens when you take the square root? Very good. You should have one plus and a minus sign. On the left-hand side, your square and square root cancel out, leaving us behind with y. And then we've got positive and negative x squared minus 9. We got our y by itself. Now let's again check and see what happens when we pick a value for x. So you want to give me a number for x? Something which will work really well with our uh, value inside the radical. Three will actually work really well. Because when you square the 3, what do you get? You get 9. Yeah. So if we use 3 for our x, that will become 3 squared. Of course, you have the minus 9 in there. 3 squared becomes 9. 9 minus 9 is not a good number. Because you're getting 0. The idea is 9 minus 9, of course, gives you square root of 0. Square root of 0 comes out to be 0. If I had used something like, I don't know, <coughs> let's do 4. If you did 4, you would end up getting 16 minus 9. What's 16 minus 9? 7. Okay. So that actually works out a little better because for one value of x, you got y to be positive square root of 7 and y to be negative square root of 7. So for one x value, you're coming up with two y values, and that happens because of that plus or minus sign, right? Technically, even though we use x equals 3, even though you're getting 0, you still have that plus or minus sign in there to give you two separate answer. So this one here, because for one x value, you're getting two different y values, obviously that means this is not a function. And the reason that's happening is because of that square on the y. But the first one, you only got one answer. There was no plus or minus. It was just one answer. So right, because that was a number that you picked, which just worked out really well with uh, 9 minus 9 giving you. No, I mean, I'm 13, I'm sorry. Well, you're talking about 13. Yes, 13. And you know, the idea was your y came out to be a variable by itself, but this guy was a y squared, which then we had to get into the square roots, and that gave us a plus or minus. And because of that plus or minus, you are going to get two different answers. But with this one here, since you had just a single y, you were not going to get multiple answers. So anytime your y has the second power, fourth power, sixth power, right, any even exponent, you are actually going to end up in a situation which is not a function.
question? Yes, Amy. So I thought it was when x is repeated that it's not a function. Not function. No, when for the same x you have two different y values, right? If you go back to the definition, we were saying for the same force coordinate, you should not have different. So for the same x, you cannot have different y. So if you look at what we did here, we started out by just using one x value, right? But we ended up getting two different y values. So that's what that function did. Okay, so then what was our next example? <coughs> x equals absolute value of 2y. Okay, so what will that give us? <coughs> Just by looking at the equation, do you have a guess as to if this will be a function or not? You're saying it shouldn't be a function? No. And you're saying it should be a function. Robert? You're saying it won't be a function. You're saying it won't be a function. It is a function? Okay. Not sure? <laughs> so since the y is inside the absolute value symbol, I cannot really isolate it. Like we did with the other two examples, you won't be able to get your y by itself. So Does that mean you can go on the right or the left? Because it snaps the value. Yeah, so what do you think will happen? So then, it will not be a function actually, and you will, you can actually do this by a simple check. So in this case, what I'm actually going to do is a reverse process. I'm actually gonna show you for two different y values, we're gonna end up getting the same x value. So if we start with y equals one, uh, that will be x equals absolute value of two times one which is, of course, absolute value of 2, which comes out to be x equals 2. So this ordered pair will come out to be 2 comma 1. Now, if I change my absolute value, sorry, my y value to negative 1, that's going to be x equals absolute value of 2 times negative 1, right? Which will come out to be absolute value of negative 2. An absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2 because all absolute values come out to be positive, which means for the same x value, I have two different y values, right? So in this case, since um, your y is inside the absolute value system, that's why this function fails. If it was the reverse, if I had y equals absolute value of 2x, that would be a function. But since the y is the variable that's inside the absolute value system, it fails. Does anybody know what kind of graph this function, this um, equation is? So if you were to actually graph this guy, This graph would end up looking something like this. And so you can see if you were to do a vertical line test through this, your vertical line would pass the graph at a certain point. So this is actually a absolute value, you know, the B <coughs> or an absolute value that's open to the right. That's what that guy feels. So remember, when your Y has an exponent of an even number, two, four, six, eight, it's not going to be a function. If your y is inside the absolute value symbol, like this one here, it will not be a function. If the y has a value of a two, four, six, or eight, that is positive. For the exponent. So like, oh, look at yeah. example 14. Okay. So like example 14. Okay, so that was about identifying a function. Did you guys have any questions on that? Sorry. Yes. This one is double check, so. Sure. For 15, it's like the whole, like when you have an absolute value, you're setting it to the positive and the negative value. It's like in a way you see it's doing, because I went ahead, so I just did 2y equals x and 2y equals negative x. Mm -hmm. That works too. So, so like 
because I know two different things. Yeah, but then what would happen is you would actually transfer that negative sign to the other side. And that's how you're claiming that for the same X, you will have two different ones. But yeah, it will work out that way. Okay, good. Any other question? Okay, so um, the next aspect that we wanna talk about for functions, actually for any relation, this is not specific to a function, is the domain and range. When we talk about domain, we're basically saying what values can you use for your x variable or your independent variable? And then based on that, we're talking about the y values, the range. So we're saying, okay, if you can use whatever these x values are, then based on that, what kind of solutions are you gonna get and what kind of y values will you get? So we're actually defining what can we use for the x and what as an outcome we get for the y. Value. So as you can see here, we're saying the domain is the relation of a relation is the set of all first coordinates. Your first coordinates normally we call them x, right? So the domain will be for all the x values. The range of a relation is the set of all second coordinates for your ordered pair. So of course those would be your y values. So looking at this example here, uh, you're given a set of ordered pairs. They want to know what the domain and range values are going to be. So we will of course write these as a set. What values can I put for domain if they are the set of all first coordinates? Yeah, all the x values, one, two, three, and four. And then for the range? Yeah, the y values, so that would be the two, four, Eight and sixteen. So of course, you know, from a set of ordered pairs, it's going to be pretty easy to identify what our x values are going to be, what our y values are going to be, if they were given to you as a table, like we saw for the identifying of a function. Again, identifying your x and y values is going to be easy. But what happens when you start looking at equations like these? How do you identify your domain and range from that? So let's go ahead and take a look at 17 here. So we have y equals square root of x minus four. Does anybody know what kind of restrictions we can have on a square root? What values can we use on the inside of a square root? Because we talked about this in chapter one again. What happens when you end up with a negative inside the square? You start looking at imaginary numbers, right? So remember, in this case, we're actually only working with real numbers. Unless they specifically ask us to use imaginary numbers, we are making the assumption that we're using real numbers only, which means we don't want the value on the inside of our uh, square root to become negative. So that's actually your starting point when you're looking at domain and range. So the inside here can be zero or greater than zero. So we're saying the value of x minus four can be greater than or equal to zero. So as long as it's a positive number, we're okay. As long as it's zero, it's also okay, right? Because square root of zero is zero. We just don't want whatever happens on the inside to come out to be a negative number. So take the value inside your red radical, set it greater than or equal to zero, and solve it, which means get your x by itself, move that four to the other side, and we are saying as long as the values of x are four, or greater than four, we should be safe, right? What happens if I put a four in here? So let's start with x equals four you will have four minus four, which will give you zero, right? We are safe. If I use a value greater than four, let's say five, that would be five minus four, which is square root of one, right? Square root of one is one. Again, I'm getting a nice 
happy number. Even if you use something like 4.00001, you know you're still going to be okay because you're not going to end up with a negative number in that case. So as long as your x values are going to be starting at 4 and greater than 4, you're not going to run into imaginary numbers here. So that's actually going to be your domain. So for the domain of this function, And we always write domain in interval notation. Remember, we talked about that in 1.7. So this is going to be starting at 4 and going greater than 4, which means you are going to infinity. Okay, so that's your domain example. Now, for the same function, what do you think the range is going to be? Where are your y values going to start at? They start at zero because if I'm starting at four for my x values, you can see when we put the four in, we got four minus four inside our square root, which gave you square root of zero, which is y equals zero, right? So for your range, you are of course going to start at zero, and as you saw, we're only going to keep going up. So you will go towards positive infinity. So how do we, do that? we say that one more time? For the range? Yeah. Okay, so I know I'm starting at four mm -hmm. for the x value. So when I put the four into my equation, you know what we did already check here? You can see we got four minus four, which is zero. Mm -hmm. Square root of zero is zero, which means with the smallest number, is giving me zero, that's my starting point okay. for the range. And then from there, I'm only going to go up. I'm not going to go towards negative numbers. So you will be going from four to infinity, including the four for your domain. And then you will be going from zero to infinity, including the zero for your range. So again, if you need to practice the interval notation to get comfortable with it, make sure you do that because uh, domain and range are only written in in trouble notation with the exception of that example. That's the only example where you write them as sets of numbers because your original was given to you as a set of order pairs, but when it's equations, you're gonna be looking at interval notation, okay? That was my question. Oh, that was your question, okay. Any other question that's kind of popping up right now before we continue with our examples? So you can see number 18 is also asking us to figure out what the domain and range is. So let's take a look at it. So we are given x equals negative y squared. What do you think will happen here? What should we do? Uh, Valerie? No. no. no? <laughs> I heard something about divide. divide by okay, start by dividing by negative one. Okay, what will that give you? Y squared equals negative x. Okay. Let's see what that does. which will give you what? Oh my guys, we just did that. Why is this square root of negative x? Okay, so we're taking square roots on both sides. We don't want a negative in there, right? And it can just, we can just stop and we have to there is no set notation for no domain in your range? Well, you are kind of putting a negative inside your x. What's going to happen? It's going to become imaginary. It's going to become imaginary. So that really doesn't help you. All right, think about this more in terms of, forget about getting that y by itself because obviously he's not helping. 
because that's putting a negative inside <coughs> in the radical, right? Okay, so we are saying x equals negative y squared. And x has to be Good. positive, a real number, right? Yes, we want both uh, domain and range to be real numbers. So, would we spell what we want to? Square root? Or no. Would I be wrong? Okay, never mind. Because it's a squared number, the negative goes away, right? Because it's going to be positive. Yes and no. So, for y values, if you pick any y values, you are going to have that square make it positive, right? But this negative is not with the square. Because if it was going to be with the square, you should have had that. So then the negative would have squared and become positive. But since this negative is obviously not inside the parentheses with the y, that will not happen. But yes, anything you plug in for y will become positive because of that square. So does that tell you anything about what the range should be? Start at negative infinity and go to zero. Why only to zero? Wait, negative. Yeah. So anything positive squared is positive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So can you do negative infinity to infinity? I mean, yeah. Positive. Yeah. Actually, that's exactly what's going to happen. Is for the range. You can do anything from negative infinity to positive infinity, which means you can use all real numbers for the range. You can put all of them in there. Because of that square, they are all definitely going to become positive. But because we have this negative sign in the front, they will definitely stay negative. Now think about this. Any number that I put in here for just the y, is going to end up becoming positive, right? But because of that negative sign in there, they will basically go back and become a negative at this point, right? Even if they started out as a positive, they're going to become negative. If they were originally negative because of the square, they became positive, and they still have that negative. So here, negative times positive will actually end up giving you negative answers no matter what. So what do you think happens to the x values, to the domain. Let's see. It's going to be negative infinity to zero, including zero. Yes, it's actually going to keep your negative, uh, your x values as negative with the exception of zero, because when y is zero, zero squared would be zero, and zero doesn't really take on a negative sign, right? So your domain, is actually going to go from negative infinity to zero, including zero, but there's no way it can jump into the positive side because that negative in front of the y squared is going to make sure everything stays negative with the exception of zero. So like I said, this part here is actually not going to help us at all if we try to get that y by itself, and you can see why because the problem is I'm going to end up with that negative being inside with my x, and we don't want that to happen. So just looking at the way the equation is given to us, they're telling us x equals negative y squared. Now ignore that negative for a moment, that y squared, you put a positive number in, it's going to stay positive. You put a negative number in, negative times negative will become a positive, but then you have that negative sign in front of it, which is going to make everything into a negative. So let's do a little check here. Let's start by using y equals 2 in our equation. So if you have x equals negative y squared, that's going to be negative. I put my 2 in there, square it, what do I get? So what's 2 squared? 4. And that negative sign just carries forward, right? So you can see your x value ends up becoming negative 4. Now, what if I use y equals negative 2 instead? So again, in my same equation, if I put negative 2 in for my y, again, what's negative 2 squared? 
it will still be a positive four because negative two times negative two becomes positive. And you end up getting positive four from here, but then I still have this negative left behind, which will again make my X into a negative value. So you can see whether I use positive or negative, my X is always gonna come out to be negative. The only exception will be when I use zero for my Y, because when I use zero, I will get negative zero squared. There's really no such thing as negative zero. Your X will become zero, right? So that's why we are including zero in our domain, but we know everything else is gonna be a negative number because no matter if I start by using a positive number or a negative number, my X will always come out to be negative, and that's because of this negative sign in front of the Y squared. Questions on 18? Domain and range is something that is actually going to show up throughout this uh, course. So every time we introduce a new function, we'll be talking about how to find domain and range. So that is something you really, really want to get comfortable with. And the second thing is to remember that we always write domain and range as interval notations. Okay, so please make sure you are practicing with that if that's something you're not uh, quite comfortable yet with. Okay, so that was talking about domain and range. Now remember how we said everything that is written as an equation can be considered a relation, but if it follows that specific definition of uh, the fact that for every x value you cannot have two different y values, that's what makes it a function. So what we came up with was a special notation so that when I look at my function or an equation that has that f of x on it, I know I'm talking about a function, which means it satisfies the definition of a function. So it's not just a relation, it is that special um, definition of being a function. So we actually use this notation and we replace the variable y with this notation of f of x. That's how you read it, f of x. So that's your function notation. They're saying x is a dummy variable because what letter you use is not important. And the idea is normally we use x, but I can also have f of t if my example was in terms of time. If my example was in terms of, um, I can think of any other variable right now. S, I don't know, in terms of, um, sorry? <laughs> so you can have f of s you can have i don't know f of m any variable you want to use so x is just a dummy variable you can obviously have it changing uh from different ones and you will also notice we just not f is again not the only uh function variable that we use we can also have g we can have h of x we can have capital F of X. I mean, again, that function definition can change. So that's the notation, but it can have many different forms that you can look at. So how does this uh, notation here work? So you will notice in this example, the function F is defined as a set of ordered pairs, whereas the function G is defined as an equation, right? You've got the three X plus five. So, the way you use function notation from a set of ordered pairs to an equation is definitely going to be a little bit different. For the first one, they are asking us um, to find out what is f of 2. Now, always remember this variable here, whatever that may be, is always going to be the first coordinate, right? The first variable. Call it the x variable or whatever you want to call it. So when I'm saying find f of 2, I'm saying go to your f function find the ordered pair where your x value is two. And that's of course going to be our first ordered pair, right? So f of two is basically saying, oh, how do I wanna write this? Let's go back to this guy. Okay. 
So what we have to remember is that f of x is being used to replace the variable y. So in your g of x function, where we are defining g as 3x plus 5, if I was writing this without the uh, function notation convention, I would actually rewrite this guy as y equals 3x plus 5. It's literally substituting the variable y with this function notation of f of x. So I am basically asking you, in this example here for function f, I am saying when x is equal to 2, what is the y value? So if you go to the function with the set of ordered pairs and you find a specific ordered pair which has 2 and 6, I am again saying if x is 2, what is y? So your f of 2 is basically saying the y value associated when x is 2. So here, we would of course say f of 2 is 6 because that's the coordinate that goes with it. Um, do we have another example we do? So with the set of ordered pairs, all you have to do is figure out which ordered pair has x value of 2 and then find its partner, right? Find the uh, y value that goes with it. But now when you're looking at a function that is defined in an equation and they're asking you what is g of 2, that means they're saying plug in your x value with the value that's given to you here, which means you are replacing your x in the equation with that 2. So what will that give us? So if I am replacing my x in this equation with 2, that's going to be 3 times x, replace that x with the 2, plus 5. And when you simplify that, what do you end up getting? 11, because you're doing 3 times 2, which is 6. 6 plus 5 is 11. So when the function is defined to a set of ordered pairs, you basically go find the y value associated with the x. When the function is defined as an equation, you are calculating. So you're substituting for your x value and then figuring out what that y value would be. So if I, if I had to write this guy as an ordered pair, I started out with my x as 2. When we went through the calculation, we got the y value as 11. So 2 was your x and 11 was your x. Yes. So this guy here is your x value. Mm -hmm. Now, they're actually switching this up a little bit. They are saying if f of x is 5, which means they are saying if the y value is 5, what pair would you look for and find the value of x? So in this set here, which ordered pair has a y value of 5? The last one, right? So this one here would be this guy, which has the f of x value. Again, remember, your f of x is replacing the y value. So you're figuring out which ordered pair has y equals 5, and then find its partner, which will be the x value. So that's going to be x equals 4. Now, how do you think that process is going to change when I look at g of x equals 35? Because again, remember, g of x stands for y. Oh, you're going to set the equation to 35. You're going to set the equation to 35. Very good. So you're actually replacing this g of x here with the number 35. So you are saying if g of x equals 3x plus 5, and I'm replacing this g of x with 35, then you are working backwards to find the x. Or 
Or what do you think that should come out to be? 20. X equals 20. 20? 10. 10? Okay. So where would you start? Subtract the 5. Which would leave us behind with 3x on this side. 35 minus 5, of course, would be 30. Yeah, divide by 3. Which would give us x on that side, and then 30 divided by 3 would give you x equals 10. Right? So you're working backwards, but in the g of x example, we have to actually solve to get our x, whereas in the f of x example, you just have to go find the ordered pair. Right? And that was again mainly because this is defined as a set of ordered pairs, this is defined as an equation. So the answer is x equals 10. 10. It's not an ordered pair like the top one. No, you can write it as an ordered pair. So as an ordered pair, this guy would then become 10 and 35. Okay. Now, individually, if you had to find f of 4 and g of 4, you would basically be repeating the process that we did here in part A and B. So can you tell me what f of 4 will come out to be? Did you hear that? Can you say it loudly? Right. It will be 5 because it's the same ordered pair that you had over here, right? Now they're asking you find f of 4. f of 4, again, that means go find the ordered pair that has the x value of 4 and then use its y value as your f of 4. So I'm actually going to go down here. Part E, f of 4 plus g of 4. So we know f of 4 is going to come out to be 5 just by looking at the ordered pairs. Now g of 4, what are we going to do? Plug in 4 and solve 4. Yeah, plug in for 4 and solve for it, just like we did with g of 2. Now you're going to replace your x with a value of 4, and that's going to end up giving you 3 times 4 plus 5. So what will that come out to be when you clean it up? <coughs> Sorry? 22. 22? Because that's going to be 3 times 4, which is 12, right? 12 plus 5. Are you giving me the final answer? Or are you giving me the answer for 3 times 4 plus 5? You don't know? Okay. What is 3 times 4 plus 5? 17. Uh, okay, and what does that add up? Okay. Questions on these five parts. Okay, so the idea here is when they're saying g of 4, especially with the equations, literally whatever number they put here inside the parentheses, you have to use that to replace the x inside your um, function. So if you were given um, something like this, let's say your function was h of x equals 2x squared. They ask you to find h of x squared plus 2. Yeah, I know. And trust me, you will see examples like this. So if they're asking you to find h of, and the quantity is x squared plus 2, that means in our equation, that's replacing my x here, and that's going to replace my x 
here. So when I do this little calculation, I have my two. I am going to replace my x with this value they're asking me to find, and then my x had a square on it. So I'm literally replacing my x with this. You are going to have x squared plus 2 replace that x. And then, of course, you would clean that up, right? Which I noticed you are still having trouble with that from your exam. You have to foil that. It's not going to be just transferring that square on the first term and the second term. So you have to remember, and really I'm not going to solve that because we have other examples where you kind of see how this works out. But whatever they give you here, you literally have to use that to replace your x in the given equation. Let's look at another example here. If you had uh, h of x equals, I don't know, square root of x uh, plus 5, let's keep it simple for now. And then they ask you to find h of let's say x squared. Whatever they give you. Anyway. <coughs> Again, this guy here will be replacing the x in your function. So that means when you are finding h of x squared, that means in my equation, I am replacing this x with x squared. The I didn't have anything on it, so we didn't have to worry about that. So I want you to look at your next set of examples. Five parts. So let me see what you guys can come up with for that. So number 20, let me see how far you can go on your own. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Some of you. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> I, just, I just want this to get in my brain. Okay. This was number 20. You are given f of x as 3x squared minus x and g of x as 4x minus 2. For part a, they're asking us to find f of a. So as I said, literally you are replacing your x with this a, okay? So when you make that substitution, you will have three instead of x, that will become an a to the second power minus, again, replace that x with an a, that's all, right? Because obviously I cannot combine these guys since they are not like terms, you are done with that portion. Part B, they asked us to find g of a plus 1. So in this case, your a plus 1 will replace the x values. So when you make this substitution happen, I have 4 times x, right, minus 2. And instead of x, you're now replacing it with a plus 1. Okay. And then what did we do after that? You distributed, right? You multiplied by 4, but that 4 will go only with the parentheses part. So that will give us 4a plus 4 minus 2. And then here, we do have these two like terms, so go ahead and combine them together, which will end up giving us 4a plus 2, right? And that's how far you can go on B. Now with part C, they were asking us to find F of X plus H. So again, remember, we are replacing the X value 
with x plus h. So again, going back, we've got 3 x squared minus x, right? And we're just using those blank spaces for our terminology here. So instead of x, those guys will now become x plus h. Very good. Now take this step by step because this is going to be a little uh, more than what we did in parts A and B here. So what's the first step I should start with? Foil. Yeah, take the x plus h squared and you're actually okay. going to foil this part first. So let's do that on the side here. Uh, x plus h times x plus h. What will that give us? x squared plus 2x h plus h. Yeah, you will get x squared from the first terms. Then you will get x times h, x times h from the two middle terms, and then of course h squared from those last ones. The two middle terms are exactly the same. So that's where your x squared plus 2xh plus h squared comes. Some of you had that written as hx, which is fine. Multiplication, of course, works in either direction. So you had 3. Remember, we just did the foil, so I'm going to replace this part here now with our x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Now, what happens on this last part with the minus x plus h quantity? Get it out of the parentheses, which means we need to so, um, distribute that negative sign for this one here. So here, make sure that negative sign is applied to both the terms inside your parentheses, which would make it negative x and negative h. But one more step before I'm done. Wait, how'd you get this in there? Sorry. These two? Or this? Oh, because what's left over. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so this here is just coming from your foil, right? Right, the second part of it. Then and you're then just the getting rid of the parentheses. Part, yeah, okay. we're just getting rid of the parentheses. <laughs> sorry. No, you're fine. You just distribute your three. Yeah, that's the last thing we have to do here is distribute this three. So that'll go with all three of these terms in our parentheses. Of course, it doesn't extend beyond that, right? So you end up with what? 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared minus x minus h. Yeah, so you're going to get 3x squared. 3 times 2 is 6, so that's going to be 6xh. 3 times h squared. And then just bring down the negative x and the negative h. Yeah. Oh. You're actually going to be coming back to these calculations when we do the difference quotient. You may be a little bit away from that. Yes? Um, on that step where you have it foiled, is that square it's supposed to be on any of your parentheses? Oh, the outside one? No, thank you. This guy should not be there. Yes, thank you. Questions on part C? You ready? Right, it has to be with the H that squared. Oh, it wasn't supposed to be out, but it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be inside with it. Is that what I did? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so that should be oh, put it back. Okay, plus H squared. There we go. Does that look better? Yeah. The way it should be. Okay, finally. <laughs> What do you think is happening on part B? G of 4x. Let's go to the top. Our G function was 4x minus 2. So again, that x is what's going to get replaced with the 4x, right, from this example in part B. So that means this guy is going to replace our x. So that is 4x minus 2 on the original function. So instead of having x in there, 
we're going to replace it with 4x. And what will that give you? 16 minus 2. Yeah, because you end up multiplying these two numbers together. 4 times 4 is 16x. Just bring down that minus 2. And of course, we cannot combine any of those two parts. Minus 6. Anybody have a question on part B? Yes. Part B is actually bringing part of your answer from step C or part C. You've got f of x plus h minus f of x. So if you look at the f of x plus h, we already calculated that in part C, right? So you actually have that step already taken care of. So all you need to do is take this answer from part C and use it for part E for that f of x plus a. So let's see if we can get this. Stay. There we go. So for the first part, for this guy here, I'm actually going to put them in brackets. So that's going to be 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3a squared minus x minus h. All of this is for this first part of f of x plus h, right? Mm -hmm. Minus the original f of x function. So your original f of x was the one that was defined for you, and this is what you're falling back on, the 3x squared minus x, because that's your f of x, isn't it? So the 3x squared minus x So bringing this portion of our problem, the f of x plus h from part c, and then the f of x is the original function that was given to us, the 3x squared minus x. Now, how can we simplify this? What should we do? Yes, Amy. Uh, combine like terms. Combine like terms before that. Yeah, again, you can see we have a minus sign here, which means just like you did before, you will need to distribute that minus sign in the second set of parentheses. For the first one, we can remove these brackets, not parentheses, actually brackets. So this would be 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared minus x minus h, keeping that part as it is, right? Just getting rid of our brackets. And now I'm distributing this minus sign, which will give me negative 3x squared, negative times negative becomes positive x. And now we combine like terms. So what happens in that case? This is plus 2x Three x squares cancel each other out. Yeah, you have a positive three x squared and a negative three x squared, which cancel each other out. The negative x and the positive x will also cancel each other out. All right, very good. Is that it? That's it. So we are now left behind with six x h plus three h squared. And what's that? Minus h? Mm -hmm. So as I was mentioning earlier, we're actually building up to talk about our difference quotient. Uh, and we're not quite there yet, but just to kind of introduce that since we will be coming back to it. Your difference quotient. is actually defined as f of x plus h minus f of x, which you will notice was the part E of our problem. And the only difference with the difference quotient here, since it is a quotient, you're dividing by h. So if I had to continue this problem here with my difference quotient, you can see I already have the numerator part because that's what I calculated in part E. With difference quotient, the only difference would be you would divide that by h. So think about it. What happens when I divide these terms by h? What would you end up getting? 
If it helps, think about it this way. Each term is getting divided by H. Yeah, so your H and H would cancel out from that first term. I've got three H squared, right? which means H and one of those H's will cancel out. And then on the last one, of course, H divided by H will just give you a one. So you would be left behind with six X from here plus three H from here and just a minus one from there. So like I said, we're actually building up to talk about the difference quotient. We're not there yet, but that's what happened here in part C and part E was we first calculated just what the f of x plus h would be, clean that up, and then from that answer, we subtracted the minus f of x. And you can see each of the terms that were left behind, each one of them had at least one h left in them. And that's a good thing, because when we do the difference quotient, when you divide by h, at least one of those h's will cancel out from each term. But as far as this problem goes, you're of course stopping right here at 6xh plus 3h squared minus h. That would be your answer on that guy. Okay, so did you have any questions on number 20? Now this will need practice. Obviously this is something you have more than likely seen for the first time. Uh, if you've done a different algebra course where they introduce functions, then you might have seen it before. But if not, I would strongly recommend you guys to practice uh, with my MATLAB and make sure you're getting comfortable with the function notation and making these substitutions. Okay, so going forward, we're getting into our average rate of change uh, example. So does anybody recognize what that looks like? It is your slope formula, right? You have the difference of the y values over the difference of the x values, rise over run. y2 minus y1 equals x2 minus x1. That is your slope uh, formula. So your average rate of change is actually based on the slope formula. We are saying if you're looking at two points uh, from a function, we're saying the average rate of change of the function as x changes or varies from x1 to x2 as the change in y coordinates uh, would be divided by the change in the x coordinates. So that's your rise over run. Your average rate of change is simply the slope of the line that passes through the two points from your function. But you know, of course, we use the term average rate of change when we're talking about models or applications. We really wouldn't call them find the slope, right? We would say find the average rate of change. So your example here is if a new Mustang is valued at $20,000 and five years later it is valued at $8,000, then what is the average rate of change of its value during that five-year period? So what's the first thing we're noticing in the value of the vehicle? $12, it went down, right? And you're right, by $12,000, because what happens with vehicles? They depreciate. The moment you literally drive out of the parking lot, right, from your car dealership, come back a day later, you, that car is not going to be sold at the same value you bought it, right? It literally does start <laughs> depreciating the moment you sign uh, on the paper and drive it out. So obviously, over five years, you can see that was a significant drop in value. It went down by $12,000, and they're basically wanting to know during that five-year period, what was that average drop that was happening? So let's look at our example here. So it started out at $20,000, and it's dropped to $8,000, and we know the time period has been five years. So if you had to write this as an ordered pair, in a way, how would we write it? 
would I use the dollar amount for my X values and the year as my Y values, or would I reverse that relationship? Reverse. reverse it. So the year would be your X values, the dollar would be the Y? Yeah. Okay, so that means this guy would be in the first year that you bought it, so that's technically year zero, right? When you bought the car, and it was priced at 20,000, but then five years later, they drop down to eight. Thousand. Why would you why would you assign them that way though? Because think about it if we were talking in terms of by how much your rate of the car had dropped hmm. or the price of the car had dropped over five years, you would say it's so many dollars for each year, right? Oh, okay. So your year would be uh, the value of the denominator, and since that's the x value in your slope formula, you want to put the x values okay. uh, for the year. Now, just using our slope formula, you can assign your x1, y1, x2, y2 a variable. So your average rate of change is going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which will be 8,000 minus the 20,000, and then 5 minus 0. So what do I get from my numerator? You should have a negative on that. What is negative 12,000 divided by 5? Negative 2,400. 2,400? Okay. So what does that negative sign tell us? Yeah, you should get that negative. And here's the reason why I insisted on us doing the um, ordered pairs. Because technically, we could have just said, oh, it went from 20,000 to 8,000. So that's $12,000. 12,000 divided by 5. I get my 2400, but what happens is if you don't remember that this value is depreciating and you don't include that negative sign, it's not going to solve the purpose that we're looking for. So in this case, we are saying on an average, uh, the price of the car went down by Four hundred dollars for you, and because you know it's not going to depreciate by the same value uh, over those five years. It may be twenty two hundred one year, but then it may be twenty six hundred the next year because all of these are dependent on the market and how the uh, vehicles are selling and all that kind of stuff. So that's why we're saying on an average over those five years, each year the value is going down by 2400, but that's not a static amount. Um, question on the Mustang. Go buy a Mustang. How many guys? So if we swap values and then you did your same formula, it wouldn't make sense because. No, because then what would happen is you'd get five on the top. Right. 1000 on the bottom, and so and that wouldn't make any sense because yeah. we already know how much it depreciated. So, yeah, okay, because you're going to get 0. 0.00 something when you actually do that decision, and you know it's not depreciating by less than a cent. So, what would happen if we just read the problem and said it depreciated $12,000 over five years and just did that? I mean. Or we have to show you, you the work. As long as you remember that the value is going down, and you make, yeah. like I said, the price of the car is going down. Mm -hmm. So make a statement about the price reducing, so that way I know you know it's going to be a negative value right. okay. and not a positive value. Okay. Okay. All righty. Um, so we are actually looking at our difference quotient right over here, and you will see how they're using that idea of the slope of a line, but instead of being a line, this is a curved graph, right? So 
That's why it's called the difference quotient. That's why it's called the average rate of change because not all these models or these examples are going to be straight lines. We know slope only works on a straight line. Um, and so in this case, we're saying on an average, kind of taking that curve into consideration, is where this difference quotient idea actually comes into play. I don't know if you guys will need to take a calculus course or not, but if you do, you are actually, this is one of the first things you talk about in a calculus course is what is a difference quotient, which will then lead you into the uh, discussion of slope of a line, which then takes you into the discussion of derivatives, which is another term that we use for slope or average rate of change, but derivatives, of course, again, works for something that's working on a curve instead of working on a straight line. So you can kind of see we're using the idea of slope, rise over run, here's our slope formula, and the difference quotient in a way is actually giving you also the slope of that curve line instead of a straight line. So your difference quotient is also talking about the average rate of change. What I would like you guys to do is try and work on this example number 22 using your difference quotient. So look at what we did in that previous example. What was it, number 20? Yeah, number 20, part C and E. I want you to work on number uh, 22 for our next class, and we will start our discussion by looking at what you guys have. Okay? All right, guys, have a wonderful evening. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank <laughs> you.